Baby? <laughs> Hi there, I'm Dave Butler. I'm Grace Freeman. Welcome to Don't Miss This. Your weekly scripture study class. We're, re- we're getting really good at that. Yeah, that's an expert thing. Uh, if you're new, you should just be impressed already by how awesome our introduction is right now. Um, we move through the scriptures week by week, pointing out things we think you don't want to miss. We're in, we follow the Come Follow Me uh, schedule, and our goal is for this to be Number one, inspiring. Number two, to help you fall in love with the scriptures. And number three, if we can help in teaching and sharing the scriptures with classes or families or other people, that is what we are trying to do. Hopefully, um, we're hitting that mark with everybody. Before we jump into some, the, the end of... We've been, for the last couple of weeks, in the Savior's personal ministry with the Nephites and Lamanites. And uh, we're coming to the very end of that today. And it's a really powerful lesson, uh, especially... Because of, and we just had general conference and remember Elder Bednar talking about Helaman is kind of the time that we're living in, essentially looking forward to what this third Nephi p- period of time might be like for all of us. It's just as things to anticipate, um, warnings, patterns of living. It's a really, really cool section of scripture. Well, and it was really exciting for me reading through it right after general conference happened because i also feel like so many of the messages were so similar to yeah. general conference this past time yeah that it was almost like i was like oh yeah that really is the words of jesus because like it just matched so yeah. and when you get to the end of third and fourth Nephi, you practically feel like you are getting done which is true we are in the fall and next year's coming which is the doctrine and covenants here which once we get to the spot, like it's hard, like I'm loving both of them at the same exact time. So what we want to say, we have a really happy announcement right now, which is that all of, in addition to these lessons that we do every single week, we also produce scripture study helps and teaching helps that, uh, that we love using both individually and as a dad and as teachers. Um, and then things that we think that you might love also. So, all of those are now available, and we just want to show you them real quick before we jump into the third Nephi lesson. This guy was such a big hit that this year that we have recreated for the Doctrine and Covenants, which is it's your daily reading and your daily do. It's a little calendar that sits on your desk, and it just points it out. This has come alive in our family over the last couple of weeks because I've kind of challenged the kids let's finish the Book of Mormon by the end of the year individually, cool. and they all get a prize if they if they finish. But Every day we just know this is where we're supposed to be on that particular day. And it just shows you like it's one little verse and then something to do that day. It's really awesome in the mornings. We do this in the mornings at our house to just say, this is not only where you're supposed to be, but this is what you could read today if you want to finish by the end of the year. It's all balanced out. But then one thing to think about today as as you live that out. And you know what? The other day, one of the kids in my class was preparing a lesson, and they said they prepared their whole entire lesson based off this. Oh, that's in awesome. In their Sunday school. And they were just like, oh, that just made it so easy because I knew exactly what scriptures to send them to, and I also had questions to ask or something to tell them an example. It was actually, I was like, oh, that's a really great idea. Super cool. So this just sits on your kitchen counter or on people's bedside tables or something like that. That's this. So it's coming back, the Read It, Live It calendar, the 365, okay? That one is coming back. Also, the posters are coming back, everybody, but look at them this year. If you are listening on podcasts, they are a five by seven size. So they just, so, so many people wanted them in different spots in their houses, more convenient by the front door or like on the window seal. Again, maybe by a bedside or a bathroom. Well, that's what I was going to say. I was really excited when I saw them because I want to put it on my mirror. Yeah. In my bathroom. Oh, yeah. They, cool. So you could take them and like actually tape them up. This They come with a stand. So there's 52 of them, one for every week. What we're going to do next year is kind of help you create a little mini lesson over these so that maybe on Sunday you might, you know, include this or Monday morning, this might be your less, a little mini lesson or something like that around these. But it's a word that comes that kind of encapsulates a little lesson from that particular week. It has a scripture on it and a quote by Joseph Smith that matches just the essence of that. And look, they just fit and all 52 of them fit on this stand that is included. So it's really easy to switch them now each week. The posters, big posters were nice, but they were a little bit harder and now they're redesigned and they can just sit on your counter just like this. And uh, that is coming this year also for the Doctrine and Covenants. Which is so fun. And then the thing that we're most excited about. You know the tippins if you've been with us for a little bit. They are little pieces of paper that slide into your scripture that kind of turn your scriptures into a study study book. Like a study Bible, but study Book of Mormon, study Doctrine and Covenants or whatever. <laughs> so this year, 
what we did is we created three different sets of those tippins. Um, at, at one for adults, Should one for people? yeah, one for teens, and then one for kids. And you're just gonna die over the design and what they include on them. So the adult ones are just like similar to what you've seen the past couple of years, right? Where just there's one for every, oh, oh, this is new. Ha, huh? there's one for every single lesson. I was just like, just like last year, it was like they were a little bit more sporadic. Yeah. So there's 52 of them in the set now, one for every single lesson. Now what's awesome is they all line up with each other. So what we're gonna do next year is we are going to teach you a little mini lesson that this might be your Sunday lesson that you have together with a family or in a class and everyone can put this in their scriptures. They have places to write on them. A lot of them do. So that's kind of part of the lesson. They're just adding it and they all have a blank back so that you could write more notes and everything in them. Yeah. Let's take a look at all the three different So there's an adult one, then there's like a teen one that's like a little bit more, honestly, Teen is generous. Like, I feel like you could, whatever age. You just want to choose the one that you love the most. I know. Want to say? I know. Because when Jenny and I were looking at them, we had a really hard time deciding which set we actually No, I know. That's the problem. So you can wanted. just, you might need, it's fine. And then this is the kids one. And so it really is technically geared to any age, but not age exclusive. What did you say? Right. Right. So there's one for every single week that you put in. They correlate with each other so that this could be a lesson that you're teaching. And we're going to help show how to use them in each lesson of next year. Where you say, oh, this is how you might teach this particular part of that section and to use your tippins for that. And I saw a comment the other day that was the most tender comment ever to me. And it was just a person that said, um, never has the Book of Mormon felt more personal to them than this year studying it. And it made me so excited about the tippins because I feel like that's what will happen with the Doctrine and Covenants is I feel like it's not only helping you understand Doctrine and Covenants, sometimes giving context, sometimes giving questions, sometimes yeah. giving ideas. Mm -hmm. But I think more than that, I think it's you being, having the ability to place your own stories, life experiences, your own living the scriptures inside of your Doctrine and Covenants. So not only is it you reading scriptures, but I feel like it's also right next to it, you living the scriptures. Yeah. So it becomes like reminders of what the lessons are throughout the book, but also like a personal journal in your scriptures yes. as well. It's like, it's both of those because they all will have something that's like worth reflecting on and worth remembering. We are over the moon about these. Just yeah. the co what they include, the fact that they all match up. So a whole family can just get, everyone can get their own, a class, everybody can get their own. And it can just be, oh, that's our weekly lesson. It's something that we're going to, and at the end of the year, just think about that book is going to be filled with, these are all the lessons that I learned. And there's a visual reminder and some of the thoughts I had when we did it. So I don't know if you can tell that we're like super, super excited about this one. Uh, about this and the design on them. So beautiful. Like they just have a really, really cool design on. Uh, I can't wait for you to, well, do you want to just see some of them? And then yeah. you'll see pictures that Should we'll post and stuff like this. Two? Like, look how awesome these teen ones are that they're just like lessons that are in there. If you're listening on the podcast, you're kind of sad right now, but you can go to our Instagram. It's going to be in the, in the website. The kid ones are the same one who designed the same lady who designs the pictures in the good news brand kid general conference journals. And they're have you, to be the you most can be 88 things. years old and you're going to buy the kid one also because the pictures are super Even cute. just to look through. Like yeah. it just, that's They are the so, so awesome. We can't wait to show you more of those. So thanks for letting us show off what is going to be next year. There's not going to be a journal next year because we really want you to focus on putting those thoughts and notes inside your scriptures so that your scripture becomes like the journal of that year. Um, you might consider getting a wide margin version of the scriptures for the Doctrine and Covenants for everybody maybe in the family and just and then getting them a tip in set that goes with it and just like we're just going to study this book and fall in love with this book this year and I feel well, like you were going to say something. Yeah, yeah and let me say this really fast because that's something that I'm really passionate about that seems superficial and not important but maybe it's because I'm a superficial human there is something about me that loves like when something is given to me as a gift I just seem to treasure it more and if it's new and exciting even like with scripture it like it is like the gateway to falling in love with it that's not what I actually love about the scriptures that's not why I love them is because it's newer it looks pretty but there's something that like 
gives me like a kickstart when that happens. And I just think like that would be such a cool, even like Christmas gift for all your family, their like own, like new set of scriptures, to just their own start pens, it out. Yeah. something that is like, they're like, wait, this is actually exciting. This is a gift. This makes me want to treasure it. And the words will win them over. That's the most important part, obviously. Like that's not, that's an easy duh answer, but there's something about like getting them excited about getting into the word. That seems so thrilling to me about next year. Yeah. And I think these are kind of a gateway to help do that. So yeah. um, we just have two lessons that we'll give you every week all set up with one, a word to think about, and then a lesson that you'll jump into a little bit more with these each week too. So each lesson, don't miss this video next year, will include just helps to help you know, what do I do with these? How do I like teach a class or a family? And so, okay. So thanks so much. Uh, we love doing this podcast. The podcast will always just be available for everybody anytime that you want it. You don't have to have any of these things, but we just think that they're things that we would love using. And thanks for letting us show them off and get excited about them. They're available now. All of these are available at Desiree Book or DesireeBook.com. You want to jump on it and get them um, so you don't get caught up in the sold out and waiting at the beginning of the year. So just snag them now. You're in the prime day mood. Just get them going and then you'll have them all ready for next year. Okay. Thanks y'all for letting us just show and tell for a little <laughs> bit and get excited about next year. Okay. Today, the lesson title of this one might be my favorite part, which is God in them. I remember uh, we were, Jenny and I were visiting her mom and dad who were missionaries in the Cook Islands. And uh, we did a little fireside over there while we were there. And Jenny spoke at it and she stood up and she said, uh, there is a lot of God in this island. And I knew exactly what she meant. And I think you might have memories or trips or time periods in your life where you're just like, there was a lot of God in that. There was a lot of Jesus in this place or in that time or in this home, or whatever it may be. And I just think we've really, literally, there was Jesus who was there among these people. If someone who lived during the later chapters of Third Nephi, they would say, there was a lot of Jesus in those days. And like, literally, he was just there like <laughs> with them. But I think here at the end, before he leaves, he teaches them how to maintain that. How do you continue to have the experience is if I'm here among you, like even when I am gone. And I think that's what's powerful about these chapters is how do I live as if he is, as if he is here. So we're 30 by 27, going to all the way to fourth Nephi. Um, at the beginning of 30 by 27, they have this kind of argument with each other and they're arguing about what to call the church. And I think it's interesting that uh, Jesus comes. And can I just point out a side lesson here for just one second? I just want a little, little, a little baby side lesson, a word that you might want to circle. Um, two side lessons, if I may. <laughs> <laughs> um, first one is in verse one. It talks about the disciples going and preaching the things that they had both heard and seen. I love that these disciples are preaching from their own personal experiences. They're not listing doc, they're not memorizing scripture necessarily or doing doctrinal treatises, but they're sharing the things that they experienced for themselves, that they both heard and saw. And I just like thinking about as a parent, as a leader, uh, as a teacher, um, trying to create experiences for people. How can I create a situation where people can hear and see for themselves? What kind of invitations can I give that will lead to people hearing and seeing for themselves? I just think there's so much power in those personal experiences that we have. And I think it's what made them really powerful teachers in chapter 27, verse one, right? There's these personal experiences they had. That's mini lesson number one that's in here. <laughs> mini lesson number two, can you circle that word again in verse two, where it says, and Jesus again showed himself unto them. And maybe in your margins, you'll write the God of again. I'm just, I just love that reminder in verse two that Jesus will show himself again and again and again. 
If you've seen something happen once in your life, it, it, plan on it happening again and again. Plan on him coming again and again. Verse three says he's in their midst. Plan on that not just being a once in a lifetime experience that he is the God of again, that he's not a one and done with people. And I, and I think that's, it would have been really sad for them to say goodbye to him, which they're going to do soon. And it's really sad when significant spiritual experiences happen for us. I just got back from a trip where we did the travels of Paul with this group. And like, I wanted to hold onto it so tightly because it was such a significant experience for us to get away as couples and have our faith built. Remember just how beautiful and good God is to talk with other people of faith to be encouraged by them. And I didn't want the trip to end, but I love remembering you. And and, and, cause you're just like, oh my gosh, I I love this so much, but I'm encouraged by the God of again. It's like, that's not the last experience you'll have like that. You will have other ones. You you can anticipate and look forward to more of um, him showing up and being in your midst. And Mm. I think that's cool, right? Like an HXP trip ends, right? And you're just like, or a good season of your life, and you're like, that was so meaningful. That was so significant. It's like, oh, that's not your only experience with him. He is, he's coming again. Hmm. You know? Which is, I think, really empowering also when you think about that first verse that you said that you talked about. They were talking about the things that they had seen and heard. And how reassuring that he gave them evidence and evidence and evidence that that would not just be one experience that they could share. Yeah. That he was like, no, I'll come back again. Like, I'll give you more to talk about. Yeah. You want another experience? Like, I will give, you don't need to get caught up on just this one thing. Like, I will be there again and again and again. And I think that's so life giving because I'm like, oh, how thrilling that no matter what, we'll have more story to share. Yeah. More of his story. Yes. Because think about like a missionary coming home. How yes. much you were just like, but I saw so many miracles. I saw lives changed. I saw, and I just want to say, if you're listening and you have a recently returned missionary, verse two is for you. He is going to show up again. You are going to experience those again and again. We're going to see that emphasized several times actually throughout these chapters. Okay. Mm. That was not even a lead in to what I what had nothing I, to do. Yeah. It has nothing to do with that. That's just <laughs> little just PS. Many lessons that I had to share it had nothing to do with this, this argument that they're having, but they are having an argument. <laughs> we about, forgot, we forgot there yeah, even was an argument. We were back at it that what to name the church. I love that Jesus is like, why are you arguing about something like this? Don't you think that sometimes you can almost hear his voice say that after we, we, you know, we've argued about something silly or we've gotten in a fight or whatever. And he's just like, for real? Okay, back up a little. Do we have to fight about this? Yeah. Do we have to argue about this? But they're arguing, what do we name the church? And Jesus says, there are two things that are going to be really important about my church that he's going to teach here. Number one is in verse eight. If it's my church, I want it to be called in my name. I I, I, I want people to know that is my church. Now, that seems like um, obvious, We don't know why there was a a disputation about that. Like, what should we call it? But I do think it's really interesting for two reasons. One, there's this idea if, if, if I say that's Jesus's (laughs) church, that's the church of Jesus Christ, you have an expectation about that church because of what you know about him. I want you to call this the church of Jesus Christ because there are things that I want people to expect. I want them to expect miracles before they ever walk in. I want them to expect people living the golden rule. I want them to expect people who make mistakes and say sorry and try again. I want people to expect uh, that they're gonna find me in that place, in my in their midst. If, if, if you go to a Disney store or a Disney cruise or a Disney theme park or a Disney hotel, there's certain things that you expect because of the name Disney. And, and Jesus is sort of saying the same. I want you to name this in my church so that it, there is an expectation for people when they see, oh, that's the church of Jesus Christ. That means I'm going to find in that place what I see in these scriptures about who he is. I, I think that's an expectation and that's also an instruction to the people of the church. Like, so beyond brand also yeah. might be his like, instruction to people of that church. Like, I, I, and, and, and then the second thing I want to say about that is like, I watched this video, um, just this last week of this, uh, grandson 
being like handed over to his grandpa for his grandpa to hold for the first time. And they told him, um, they told the grandpa the name of the grandbaby and the grandbaby was named after the grandpa. And I just was so touched by the grandfather's response. Like he was so moved that they would name that baby after him. And I just thought about God in heaven and our savior and him, I think being just as touched when we take upon ourselves his name, when we say like, I, I want to live like you. I want to live the way you've shown me to live. I want to live up to your name. I want I, w- I want people when they see me to see you. And I've always thought about like me, the responsibility of taking on his name. And I guess I've just never thought about how sweet it is for the savior to see his disciples wanting to take on his, his name and wanting to carry on the message and wanting to carry on the heart of him throughout the world. I just, mm. it's like, I, I just never considered how touching that is to him, you know? Yeah. And why does that make you want to cry? And it makes you want to be so much more proud to say, like to me at least, to say the church I belong to. Yeah. You know, like it makes me want to own that up. It makes me want to like shout it from the rooftops because yeah. I'm like, wait, I am proud to be named after him. Right. That's a pleasure right. for me. That's yeah. an honor. That's a privilege yeah. that I get. And I think like there's kids who don't get to meet their grandpas or know their grandpas, but there are some kids like, you know, who, who are like, I have so many things to say to my son, Jones Allen, because he's named after my grandfather, you know, hmm. and Christian David is named after me and my dad. Like, I just, I love that I have stories to tell about this is who you're named after. This is the kind of life they lived. And, and just, you just feel a sense of, you know, I, I wanna, I wanna do that. Anyways, there's something real, like, I just, like, have fallen into this, like, sweetness about this idea of being named after him and being, belonging to a church that bears his name. 100%. Yeah. So that was the first thing, right? Where he's just yes. like, remember, he says, okay, there's two things I need for my church. Number one, I want it to be named in, uh, have my name. Yes. Number one. And then it's almost as if for me that he is going to dive into that a little bit deeper. And he's going to say, number two, you're going to find this in verse 10 of chapter 27. He's going to say, and that church is going to need to be built upon my gospel. That is going to need to be the foundation. And he unpacks it. And it's so funny because the word gospel, we use it so many times, like so often, even we're quick to say like, oh, what does the gospel mean? And like, I think probably if you've been watching this for a while, I think maybe your first instinct might be to say like good news. Like that's what the gospel means is good news. I think we talk about that a lot on here. Or maybe you hear the word gospel and you immediately go to what we hear, like how to live the gospel, faith, repentance, baptism, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. We go through this list of things and we're like, okay, that's the gospel. But he's going to say, listen, My church needs to be founded in the gospel. And in case you forgot what the gospel is, let me give you a clear definition. Let me remind you what the gospel is, which is interesting because that's also not his first time explaining the gospel to this group of people. It's like he's done that before. We've had that in other chapters. But the definition he gives in this chapter has to be one of the all-time best. And you're going to see it start in verse 13. And this is going to be the word of the week poster. We're going to go through it at the same time, everyone, just so you know. Don't think I neglected it, but we just have to walk through it, okay? And it's going to be verse 13. Behold, I've given unto you my gospel, and this is the gospel. He says, here's the definition. You wondered what it is. This is the gospel, which I have given unto you, that I came into the world to do the will of my Father, because my Father sent me. And I think we need to pause right here for a second because it's going to describe the will in verse number 14. And it's going to be that Jesus decided to suffer and die for us on a cross. That's going to be the will of the Father. And I think we talk about that so often. But to me, this time when I read it, specifically with verse number 13, it began to mean something so much more to me. Because all of a sudden he said, do you know what the gospel is? The good news. You could fill it in a good or joyful message, a revelation of the grace of God to fallen man through a mediator. You're going to see all of these different definitions for the word gospel. You wonder what the good news is, the gospel is is that Jesus really did what he said he would. Mm. Jesus really 
obeyed the Father. Jesus really fulfilled prophecy. And I think what we are so quick to forget is that was a choice for him. He could have chosen not to do it. And who knows what the world would have looked like, but that's part of life on earth is that you do have agency. He was not forced to die on the cross. He was not forced to take upon him the sins and the pains and the sufferings and the sicknesses and the disappointments of all of mankind. That wasn't him being forced into that position. That was a choice. And to me, the good news of the gospel, the reason the gospel even is good news, what the gospel is, is the fact that Jesus chose us. That Jesus chose to do what he said he would. He was not forced to do that. He was not forced to love us. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that he willingly chose. And, and, I, and I think that's cool, that word willingly, because that we sometimes forget that's what that word will means. It was the, the will of the Father, the wishes of the Father were this as well, for both of them, right? Yes. So it's like, I, I, this is what I wanted is what Jesus is saying. And this is what the father wanted. This was his intention. This was his, the gospel is the intention of the father and the son, the end goal, the end game for both of them, which is in 14. 100% because he's going to go through and he's going to say, my father sent me that this is his will. This is what he hoped for, that I might be lifted up upon the cross. And after that, I had been lifted up upon the cross that I might draw all men unto me. And isn't that the good news of the gospel? Isn't that something to cheer and to celebrate? That Jesus willingly and just absolutely no questions asked said, I will choose you. I will suffer for you. I will fill for you. I will save you. I. He chose that. He chose to do that, not just for a few people, not just for one group of people, not just for the good guys, not just for the people that didn't have that much to suffer for, but for all men, that he would draw all men unto him. And that to me is the gospel that Jesus said, I will create a path for every single person to be near to me that they could be close to me, that they could experience what I have to offer them, that they could be loved by Jesus. And it just makes me think back to so many conversations that I've had with people that are tear-filled and worried, like just like sick to their stomachs of saying, I just don't think that this is working for me. I just don't think that he would still choose me. I just don't think that he still could love me after I did this, after I felt this, after I made this decision. And to that, I want to say to those tear-filled eyes and to the anxiety-filled stomachs that he chose to love you. He, that is something worth celebrating. That is something worth calling good news. And even better than that is he didn't just say, this is what I'm willing to do. But he said, I will also give you a path to experience that. Mm. I don't want you to just say like, oh yeah, like he loves me. He loves me. He loves me. He said, let me give you a way to live that will help you experience and know of a surety that's true. He says, faith, that's for everyone. If you believe in me, you're that set. Repentance, that's for everyone. Forgiveness is not held back. Forgiveness is a liberal gift to him. He says, repent, whoever. I want all people near to me. No limitations to that sentence. Repentance for everyone. Baptism for everyone. Gift of the Holy Ghost for everyone. You want to experience his love, you can. That's the good news of the gospel. Yeah, me. yeah. And I love that idea where you're like, the good news of the gospel is G the Father and the Son chose us and showed us how to choose them back. And, <laughs> and I love how you just worded that. Like, let me show you how to experience that love, how to live in that love, mm -hmm. right? Trust me, turn to me, become connected with me. Like that is the gospel. I love that this is a spot in scripture where you can teach so clearly what that word means. And Jesus says, I want my whole church to be based on that. I want all my lessons to be based on that. I want you to live your lives like in that truth right? Because I start to live differently if I know that that's the level of commitment the Father and the Son have for me. 
right? Yes. And it's just like live like that. Live under. I want everything in my church to be based on that truth. And I want to just point out, because you're going to see this again and again and again in these scriptures, and get out your pencils and pens and start circling every time you see that word all. All people, all men, everybody. Like that is part of what the definition of the gospel is, is that it's an invitation to all. And I just think that's a really important aspect to the definition of the gospel that we don't want to miss here. That mm-hmm. it's like, this was the will and the heart of the Father and the Son to draw, to, to draw all men un, unto them, that they might be lifted up. I want to lift up all of you. I want to exalt every single one of you. I want you to all to experience this. And like you were saying earlier, that this was a choice of, of the Savior, he gives us the choice to engage as well with him. Someone will say like, I want that. I want to live in that. I want to build my life on that. And he's just like, you can, and I'm going to give you the choice for it. In fact, I love you, that there is, you can go to that next one. Um, this question he asks to his disciples at the beginning of 28. Now, this is the story, if you've read the Book of Mormon, about the three Nephites, who their story is kind of fun because they're going to live forever on the earth Right. And, and they are going to minister to people the rest of their lives. Um, the, the, in their verses where you're going to find a lot of those alls, they want to like go and reach all people, like wherever they are in, in the world. And of the 12 disciples that Jesus has, uh, nine of them say, we want to do your work until the end of our lives. And then we want to be taken up to live with you again. And he says, what a great desire. And to the, th- the other three say, we want to just do that forever and ever and ever. And he just says, also, what a fantastic desire. And it, it almost like elevates it as if to say, oh, if you think doing it to the age of 72 is good, try doing it forever and ever and ever. It's more blessed only because you're doing it for more time, right? But what I am intrigued by is the question at the beginning of chapter 28, in verse one, what is it that you desire of me? Uh, his way of saying, what do you want? You may have heard me tell this story before that I met this Hindu priest once who said to me um, that that is one of the most important questions in the world. What do you want? And then he said, it's really easy to give an answer to that question, but it's difficult to give a good answer to it, to really dig down into your heart and say, what do you actually want? And I, I made this list for you. Remember, this is always on the app, everybody, these boards, but, or you can screenshot this and see it. Just a handful of times that I saw him ask that question to the Nephites. What do you want? And it just reminds me of, of, of Jesus, uh, elevating our desires where he just says, what you want is important. It's important to want something. That's what drives what you do or what those desires are in you. Um, Jesus will tutor our desires if we let him. He'll mold them. He'll, he'll sanctify those desires in us. But he wants, he wants to ask us that. What, what do you want? What does your heart actually want? You know, and, and it's his way of saying, I think this, um, I've just been thinking recently because Again, I was on that, that trip that was, you know, in ancient places in Athens and Rome. And, and in those kind of places, like you're compelled to just ask yourself this question, like, what do I want to be remembered by? There's all these like monuments to people's lives and their deeds carved into stones. And it makes you think like, what kind of person do I want to be? And, and what kind of life do I want to live? And what do I want to be remembered by? And I feel like Jesus is asking them that. How do you want to live out your life? You know, because you can base it on um, some people back in 2711, he said, will base their lives on the works of men, the things they see everybody else doing around them. Some people will base their lives in verse 11, he says, on the works of the devil. They'll choose the the selfish, the the self-centered um, nature of the devil. Everything's about me. And he says, but there is some way to live your life that, um, in a way that it, it never fades and it never goes away. And, and these, and, um, 
he had said it at the end of chapter 27, verse 27, what manner of men ought ye to be? Verily I say unto you, even as I am. If you want to live a kind of life that stands the test of time, that thrills your heart like nothing else would, I've set a pattern out to show you how to do that. And chapter 28 is an example of these 12 disciples living out their lives in the way that Jesus lived it. Well, and something, verse 13 in this chapter 28 is so interesting to me because I think if Jesus was willing to ask this question, how many is that? Six? Six times within two chapters, we can probably guess that he didn't just only ask that question six times. If he thought it was important enough to ask six times, I'm going to guess he probably asked it a few more times after that and a few times before that as well. And what happens after um, one of the last times that he asks this in verse number 13 is they have this experience where it says, And behold, the heavens were opened, and they were caught up in heaven, and they saw and heard unspeakable things. And I love to think about the fact that maybe, just maybe, um, before you ask for what you want, you should remember what he's capable of. And the more that they realized what he was capable of, I wonder if what they asked for changed. And maybe they started asking for more unspeakable things, things that they never would have ever thought to ask until they remembered who they were asking. Someone that is capable of creating more incredible things than we even have the words to describe. And I just like put hearts all around verse 13 because I would hope that I can live my days caught up in heaven. Mm. And when I look around, that is what my life will be like, that I am caught up in heaven. And that at the end of the night, I can say, you know what? I saw things today and I heard things today that are unspeakably good, that were so good that I don't even have words in the English language to describe them. And that maybe when I get down on my knees at the end of every night, what I ask our Father in heaven for will be different because of what I experienced with him that day. And I think that that question is one that we will ask for the rest of our lives. Who do I want to be? Yeah. What do I want to be known for? Yeah. And that question is really, really powerful. But I think the answer is even more remarkable when we remember who our Heavenly Father can make us out to be. The one who created heaven and earth can help us become that type of person. And I just love 28, and I think this time I especially did, because I just turned 25, and for some reason right now, I'm not even in like a midlife crisis, but it feels like I could be. I was like, I just like, <laughs> don't laugh. That's true. That's a true. It's a quarter life crisis. And, that, and that's fine. That, you could call it what you want, right? It's just that doesn't ring as good as a <laughs> midlife crisis, okay? And I just had this moment. I like quarters. <laughs> <laughs> and I just like feel like I'm in this moment that I really do want to pause and think about who I want to be and what I want my life to look like. And you don't want to ask someone that hates their life, like, oh, what should I be for my life? What should I do for my life? Like, you only want to ask that question to someone that you're like, wait, they are loving the life that they have created. Mm. And the truth is, the only people that would say like, let me live forever, let me do your work forever, have to be people that don't hate doing his work. He, they had to have been people that loved the life that they were living so much that they would want to live it for the rest of their life. Right. And I don't know if I can always say that about myself, that I love my life so much that I would want to live the exact way that I am for the rest of my life. Mm. And it makes me really want to look at who these people were and what they were doing in their life to experience something that they said was worth living forever doing. That's good advice. That's someone that I would want to pattern my life after. And I think that's really cool to look in the end of chapter, in the middle of chapter 28, actually, and see what they did. Like, I love verse 26, but behold, I've seen them and they have ministered unto me. In one sentence, if someone would say that about me, that would be a life well lived. That they said, oh no, even just seeing them, right when they saw me, they helped me. Or all of a sudden, verse 29, and she'll bring out of them unto Jesus many souls. And they do whatsoever man is seemeth unto them good. And great and marvelous works should be wrought by them. And I just think that that's an important question to ask. Who you want to be and what you want your life to be like. And I think it's important who you ask that question to. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And and I, I really like this idea of studying chapter 28 with like a lying down the middle and on the left side saying like, 
Um, how did they live? Because you can find phrases in here that describe how they lived. Like they they lived there. Well, they're still living, but you know. <laughs> so true. Right? That's so true. But it's it's awesome to look at people the way that they chose to live. Like you were saying, like they ministered. I like I love in verse 16, they did again minister. Like yes. I, I, like they are the kind of people who just like didn't just do it once. They kept reaching out, right? And and then on the other side of that column to just find the words and phrases that describe what their life was like. Mm. And one of the things in there is they'll experience sorrow. This life has pain and this life has sorrow and this life has suffering in it. Like this is not a pattern of how to avoid pain and suffering. It's, it's a pattern of how to avoid some kinds of pain and suffering, but it's like that will be a part of it. Right. They'll suffer because of this. They'll, they'll have sorrow because of the sins of the world, which is another way of saying love. Right. They just love will have that included in it. But I just love phrases like this. More blessed are, are they? What if verse seven, you live to behold the doings of the father? You know, it's just like, Oh yeah, you had to still take out the garbage every week and you had to pay your taxes and you had to go to the dentist like everybody in the world does but you also live to behold all the doings of the father, right? You, you had to like go to work. You had to, um, <coughs> uh, did I say pay your taxes? Because maybe yeah, this but is that's like painful. something that's like, hurting you, like obviously. Hurting. <laughs> right? You had like, you just had to like, um, you got bumps and cuts and scrapes like everybody else, but you lived in a way, verse 10, where your joy was full. You felt one with the father and the son. You, you uh, Verse 19, prisons could not hold them. Like th- those things that describe, like that, they just show that the kind of impact they had couldn't be held back. It couldn't be snuffed out. It made a change in the world. It made an impact. And they lived in this beautiful way. And I just like the invite and God was in them in verse 26. And 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 I love in 33 where it just says, if all the scriptures gave an account of all these marvelous works of Christ, you would, according to the words of Christ, know that these things must surely come. 28, uh, that verse, 28 verse 33 is a way of saying, if that could happen back then in these records of scripture, then take it as evidence that they can be happening right now for you as well. And that's kind of what that chapter 29 is all about. It's just like when these words come forth, take that as evidence that God is moving and working among us. Take it as evidence that these words are, that they're true, that God is is still among us. So just like take that as evidence um, that this kind of fulfilling life can be lived right now as well. And what's going to happen is third Nephi is going to finish up. And it almost feels as though he is going to say, I, at the end of all of this, everything that you've just experienced, what you have seen and heard and the marvels and the miracles and the wonders, everything that you've just experienced, just like David was saying, should invite you to a new way of living. Mm -hmm. They should be calling your heart to live a life better and honestly, probably different than you had ever imagined your life living. And um, it's almost chapter 30. It has to be the smallest chapter in all of third Nephi, which I think is a really cool lesson because it almost feels at the very end. He's like, listen, this isn't going to be that complicated yeah. and it's not going to be a lot to take in. Here's your invitation to live how Jesus just taught you. And it's not necessarily easy to live that way, but it is simple is what yes. that little chapter says to us, yes. right? Not easy. No. Being a disciple requires something of you, but it's pretty simple. Yes. Right? It's not overly complicated. Yeah. We can engage in it starting today. If you've never done it your whole life, there aren't any prerequisites. Like you could start today with wherever you're at, whatever your past was like, whatever your situations are, whatever neighborhood you live in, whatever age you happen to be, you could start today. You can engage in this lifestyle today. Yes. And we called this little chapter, the last lecture. That's the kind of like, you hear that all the time in academics where there's that like book that like is so, so famous about 
Like in academics, usually when you're about to retire, you give one last lecture and it's kind of just like how you want to go out, the most important things that you feel like you could teach. And then yeah. obviously there was that one guy that kind of made that phrase really famous, the last lecture, because it really was the last lecture of his life. And it, he kind of stopped and like gave this last lecture of how to live. And it almost feels as if this is that last lecture from Jesus. That it's just like, okay, like this is how you should live. And it's written like, and I just think that's the cutest part in chapter 30 verse 1 that it's like Jesus looked and he said I need you to write this down I need you to make this clear to my people that this is the way I, that I should speak concerning you for behold he commanded me that I should write and then he writes all of this advice and that's the worksheet for this week and it goes through and it kind of just breaks down this little last lecture from him and this little invitation on how to live a life that is good that is full of wonders and marvels. And to me, it just seems like an invitation to not let this, like what they had just experienced with Jesus be the best that they ever had. That in fact, like it could continue. It wasn't the end of their experience and the marvels and the wonders and the miracles. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was an invitation to keep living a life like that. And you can go through, and we wrote them all down all across this worksheet, and you can find eight things. It starts at the very beginning, the very first word, hearken. Hearken to the words of Jesus Christ. You listen to him, which I love that that is true for like the next three verses. The next, it's just actually two. I just did a lie. The next two verses of that chapter of like, listen to these words. But I also love that for me, when I hear that, it's a promise that Jesus Christ will keep speaking to me the life that I need to live. And I just need to keep listening, to keep giving him my heart, and he will speak to me the life that I need to live. And I want to say, too, that I think a really important part of that is not so much the verb to hearken, but who you're hearkening to. We come here at 35 chapter 30, but it's almost like, please go back to 35 chapter 11. And please go back to First Nephi chapter 1, in fact. But at least if in our nearest memory, start in Third Nephi 11 and let's remember whose words we're hearkening to. It's not just anyone. You know, we can say like in, in a class, listen up, you know, and like to who? To show respect, yes, or whatever. But what if who's speaking is Jesus Christ, the son of the living God? Right? And let's remember who he is when we decide to listen. Mm, beautiful. And he's going to call and say, listen, turn away from your wicked ways. Repent is number three. He's going to keep going through. He gives you a list of things to repent for, and you fill in the blank for you. I did for me. And then <laughs> what's going to happen is number four, go to him. Come unto him, he says. Number five, be baptized. Wait, and isn't this really interesting? I, I just thought of this barely because like really we could say a whole lot of things about these one yeah. like turn from those wicked ways but the gospel is not so much about turning from wickedness as turning to something better that'd be a better definition of it it's not don't do bad it's take away the bad so there's room for something better but then when he says come unto me this is a, the list of people. He says, it, even if you have secret abominations and whoredoms and deceivings oh, cool. and lyings and murders and priestcrafts and envies and strifes on your record, come unto me. That list of those things did not just, that's after those things have happened. They're already on your record. He says, those don't disqualify you from coming unto me. It makes me think about Peter, these two spots in the life of Peter, the apostle, and when when he heals the waves, what? When he calms the waves, it's a way of healing them. When he calms the waves, Peter says, I, I can't be near you because I'm a wicked man. Mm. But then at the end of his life, after he's denied him three times and Jesus was on the beach, Peter dives out of the boat and swims and runs to him. And you're sort of like, at the beginning of Peter's life, he kind of thought, I'm disqualified from coming near into you because of what I'm like. But at the end of his life, after his greatest mistake, he still knew he could run to him. He's like, in those three years, he learned something about him. That it's just like, the fact that you needed to repent doesn't disqualify you from coming closer to me. And the fact that I think that is such an empowering thought, that that's not like 
plan X because you fell apart in all the rest of the plan. Like this was his last words for you. Yeah. He's like, no, like, like this is what your life is going to look like. And just because of what you just experienced does not mean that you are not going to slip up again in the future. But that doesn't mean that our relationship is over. Mm-hmm. You're not done with me just because you mess up once I'm gone. There is still, you're still working through this relationship with me. Yeah, right. And awesome. he's going to go through the next one, be baptized, have a relationship with him, make promises with him, continue to build your relationship with him, receive a remission of your sins, be filled with the Holy Ghost, be numbered among his people. And isn't that just like in my head when I read it, I'm like, yes, of course. Yeah. Of course, that's the life that I want to live. Yeah. You know? Right. And that is what he's inviting you to live. Not just experience him once, but to have him for the rest of your life. Which is why we made it in a circle. So at, while you share this and teach this, or if you print this out and slide it in as a tip in for the Book of Mormon, because we didn't have 52 yet <laughs> for this year, right? Remember that circle part is it just keeps happening again and again and again. And I like fourth Nephi as just a evidence of people who lived that, right? And, and, and that's what it is. And that's what you can do with a study of fourth Nephi. Fourth Nephi is almost like this pattern for the millennial day of what that's like, not only as an individual person lives that out, but as a group of people live that out. And I just want to make it known that fourth Nephi is a people who live that circle. Can we go back to that yes. circle? And that part of that circle is turning and repenting, right? These aren't people with a flawless record. There are people who just keep turning and repenting. They keep turning and repenting. And that's what helps create fourth Nephi. Perfection doesn't help create fourth Nephi. The hope of Jesus and in, in who he is and our second chances creates fourth Nephi. So let's not forget that those are a part of what helps create fourth Nephi. Right? We, we might think I've disqualified myself from a fourth Nephi life. And he just said to you right before it started, no, you didn't. Right? But fourth Nephi is a great study and just, and learning and, and circling and underlying what a life looks like as somebody tries to live third Nephi 20s, 20, 20, a little bit, 27, 27, right? Like live like me. Come and live in this way. Right? So it's almost like a repeat of that chapter 28, but everybody all together. And I don't know, do you want to just say, oh, the, the journal, by the way, includes like these verses and you'll find others. P.S. I wrote some and I even added some from a year ago when I wrote that journal. Yeah. So that I was, oh, the, and there's these and there's these and there's these. So it's just a sampling of on one side, you can list what that happiness looks like. It says there never was a happier people. They live really, really happy lives, you know? And um, and you can just see some of those. So you want to say what? A My favorite, of yours? this might be yours. I'm stealing it. Sorry, I have to. Is verse number seven. And one of the reasons I like it so much is because the beginning of third Nephi seemed pretty scary. And there was burnings and earthquakes and darkness. And when you read it, you like kind of in your head, it does make you afraid. Like you're like, what is going on? And why is that happening? And I'm not sure if that's the God I believe in with the burning and the quakes and the darkness. Like I just don't, that seems different to the character that we know him as. And it almost feels like in verse number seven, it's wrapping up that story Mm. that you think the end of the story is in the beginning of third Nephi. And then you're like, okay, well, I guess Jesus comes and that's that. But that's not even the end of the story yet. Because what happens is then in verse seven, it says, and the Lord did prosper them exceedingly in the land. Yea, in so much that they did build cities again, where the cities had been burned. Mm. And that is what I want to remember when I read third Nephi and the very beginning, when all of that's burning is happening that's not the end of the story. Destruction isn't the end of the story. What you think is finished and complete and you're saying, there's no more hope for that. That was the end. I'm hopeless. That was it. Can be rebuilt with Jesus. Mm. Whatever has been destroyed, whatever has fallen apart, Jesus's promise is that it can be rebuilt. And if you are in the middle of something that feels like destruction and the end and a nightmare situation and you're saying, this is it. There's no way that this can be recovered now. This isn't the God I know. 
This isn't what he would do. I wonder if in heaven he is just whispering down. This isn't the end. I can fix that. I will take care of it. I can rebuild what has been lost. Yeah, and tie that to verse 5, that he heals the sick, he raises the dead, the lame will walk, the blind will see, the deaf will... Like, whatever is, like unfair or not right like they can be healed and fixed and progress in in jesus and that's what this life is is like my favorite one i think is verse 15 where it just says two things that i love everyone was converted it says in verse 2 it's what makes it millennial so everyone was converted but it just says this and and the and the marker of that conversion was no contention and no disputation and I think this will come out at a perfect time right before a November election. But it's like that was the that was the evidence that the love of God was dwelling in their heart. And I like that in 15. That they didn't just feel the love of God, it took up residence in in their heart. And it made a change um, in them. And I and that's awesome. The other half of this is a fall from that in fourth Nephi. And you can study that too. This is what it looks like to have a happy heart. This is what it looks like to have a hard heart. Right. Um, and, and, and you, you will read through those and see those, some of the warnings that we see there. But I like that both of them are there because it, it means that this is a choice and it empowers me that I can make a choice here, that I can decide the kind of life I want to live, no matter what my circumstances are. So the fact that I can fall from this actually makes it real authentic love. The fact that I could choose not to is really empowering. You know, there's just something ab- about that to me that just makes it real and it makes it have an impact is that I could fall from it if I don't maintain it, if I don't continue in it. Like that possibility, I think is important to realize that it's there. And if I can fall from it, it also means I can go back to it that I can rebuild, I can turn and repent as well. So even though that's a sad ending to 4th Nephi, I just love the idea that 4th Nephi is presenting a choice. It says, you can choose this and you can fall from it, just so you know, which makes it just feel more authentic if you can fall from it, you know? Um, But also if you can fall, you can come back to it as well. And I think that's a really powerful lesson. It ends almost with Jesus saying, read forth Nephi. And then now let me ask you the question, um, what kind of life do you want to live? What manner of person do you want to be? W- what, how do you want to experience this world? What do you want to be known by? Mm-hmm. You know? So, And who doesn't want to be known by there could not be a happier people among all the people who have been created by the hand of God? Excuse you, me. Right, right. And it's just in your hand. It's in, it's simple. It's in our capacity to experience that level of happiness. It is for all of us. Hmm. Not because of us, but because of, but because of him. Remember, this whole thing is fueled by and fired by the will of the Father and the Son to come down and rescue us, that they chose us first, that they loved us first. And that's what fuels all of this. That's what keeps us Uh, that's what intrigues us and that's what keeps us involved in it as well. So it's just beautiful. Such beautiful Mm. chapters. We're so sad. Third and fourth Nephi are ending, but um, the next books have really, really good stuff too, I promise. (laughs) Okay, see you next week.